grieving various losses and disappointments. I think of high school and college seniors who are not going to get to walk across a platform in the presence of their friends and their family members and celebrate together their great accomplishments. I think of those who have already experienced job loss or a cutback in hours. I think of those who are looking forward to a banner business year in 2020, but have since had to shutter their businesses in hopes of reopening when the danger and the distress have passed. I think of those who have had to cancel long planned and longed looked forward to trips and vacations. I think of weddings that have been postponed, baby showers that can no longer be held in person but are held over things like Zoom and Skype and other technological avenues. I think of grandparents who are unable to visit or hold that very first grandchild. You know, earlier this week, I uh, opened and edited a document for our weekly staff meeting here at Mountain View. And I just deleted every single upcoming event for the month of April off of that document, gone with one keystroke. And I had to sit for a minute and process what I had done and process the fact that there's so much right now that we can't do that we want to do. And because of that, there's probably not enough disappointment to go around for all of us. You know, all of these disappointments in one way or another are, are a small death, a death that will have to be grieved. And I feel confident in saying that, look, if I didn't mention the particular disappointment that you feel in this moment, the fact is that disappointment itself probably resonates with you in some way, shape, or form, a form that you need to acknowledge and I need to acknowledge. But here's what I want us to do this morning as we dive into this text. I want us to do more than simply acknowledge disappointment. I want us to own it. I want us to enter into it and to explore what the Lord might have for us in the midst of it. And more importantly, as a result of it. So here's the first question I want us to ask and answer this morning. Why do we face disappointment? And it's really right here in the text, okay? If we go to the middle of the text and we launch in at verse 21, Jesus' two disciples who are being accompanied by him, unbeknownst to them, have um, now engaged in answering the question that the risen Jesus had for them about the events that had occurred over the past few days. And in verse 21... These two disciples, in answer to Jesus' question, say, but we had hoped that this Jesus was the one to redeem Israel. If you were to boil it all down, disappointments equal unmet expectations. Notice those initial words of Jesus' disciples, but we had hoped. Now, Jesus' own disciples had certain expectations for Jesus, certain hopes regarding what they believed Jesus as Messiah had come to be and to do. And really, their hopes were no different from the hopes of the majority of Jews alive at the time. This is what we talk about when we enter this particular day called Palm Sunday. The passage that I read at the beginning of the service from the Gospel of Matthew is really a passage repeated throughout all four Gospels, namely the fact that Jesus came triumphantly into the city of Jerusalem nearly a week before his crucifixion. And he came into the city with praises and with shouts of Hosanna, simply meaning, Lord, save. And so many of the Jews, including Jesus' disciples, had an idea of Messiah that really looked more like a military leader coming to uh, address the oppression of the Romans and kick out the Romans and reestablish Israel as a sovereign nation state. But by the time the week was over, these disciples and all of Jesus' other disciples and all of those pilgrims who had shouted Hosanna 
their hopes and their expectations were kind of dashed against the rocks because Jesus was not the kind of Messiah that they thought he might well be. And when these hopes were dashed, Jesus' own disciples experienced a deep sense of disappointment. You know, the same thing happens to us. Expectations in, experiences out that do not match or live up to those expectations. The result equals disappointment. Now this feeling of being let down, it can be aimed in any number of different directions. It can be aimed at the friend you once thought trustworthy who is now spreading rumors about you. It can be aimed at the spouse who promised that they would love you forever, but recently left you for another person. It can be aimed at the supervisor who threw you under the bus in order to save his own job. It can be aimed inward when you realize that you're not quite as far along spiritually or financially or career-wise as you thought you would be at this point in your life. Here in our text, we see the disappointment of two disciples directed at Jesus. Now, these two disciples don't yet know that the risen Christ, victorious over death and the grave, is walking with them. And so they've exposed their own disappointment in Jesus to Jesus himself. And he's going to deal with that shortly. But here's what you and I need to see. When it comes to the Lord, just like these two disciples, we often struggle with the same thing, disappointment over unmet expectations. We expect God to come through for us in a way and at a certain time, and when he doesn't, our hopes are dashed against the rock of those expectations. Or maybe it happens to us the other way around. We expect that God will protect us from some calamity or pain. And when he doesn't, our hopes are again dashed against the rocks of our expectations. And you know what? Here's the thing. I want you to be honest with me for just a minute. It hurts deeply when you feel like the one person who's holding it all together suddenly lets it all fall apart. I want you to know this. You and I are often disappointed by God because we've put expectations on God that don't align with God's purposes. Expectations that began not in His heart, but in our big dreams for Him. Jesus' disciples had big plans for Jesus. Plans that came crashing down as the nails were driven into their master's hands, plans that never once accounted for a cross. And the same goes for us. We think God should be doing things one way, and when he doesn't, we feel let down. We think God should follow our plans rather than the other way around. The disciples of Jesus did not understand, and sometimes we don't, that death for Jesus wasn't a defeat, but a victory. It wasn't the end of the road. It wasn't a sign that Jesus was not who they thought he was. In fact, it was the exact opposite. It was a victory. The defeat of death, the beginning of new life, and the very sign that he was exactly who he said he was. And had come to do exactly what God had sent him to do. Brothers and sisters, if you and I are going to receive what the Lord has for us during this particular season of disappointments, you and I may well have to allow him to sift our expectations through the cross. And come to terms with the fact that he's not necessarily going to give us everything we want for whatever his reasons, perhaps known only to him. But even if he won't give us everything he wants, we can always count on him to give us everything we want, need. In partnership with 
the Lord Jesus. As we come alongside him and take his yoke upon ourselves, you and I may need to come to terms with these disappointments in such a way that we start living in the real world. And we start accepting them for what they are. On our Facebook page, under the menu tab, you'll find a little handout, handout that will help you do that. It's called um, Skills for Radical Acceptance. And those skills are, 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 are meant to enable you to get to the place where you can surrender your shattered expectations to the Lord and potentially find the Lord there to meet you in the midst of those shattered expectations. So, what are disappointments? Disappointments are essentially shattered expectations. Second question I want us to ask this morning is this. What if, what if our disappointments, those shattered expectations and dreams, are the very place that God wants to meet us? Go back to the passage. Go back to verse 13. That very day, two of Jesus' disciples were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all of these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him, and of course, he then began to engage them in discussion, knowing full well what they were talking about, but wanting to enter into this time with them because, as we're going to see shortly, he had some things he wanted to teach them. And more importantly, he wanted to reveal himself and offer them his special presence during their disappointment. Now, I've already said that these two disciples were sad. In fact, Luke tells us that they stood still when Jesus initially asked them a question, looking sad, disappointed, lost hope. And here's what I want you to know. These two disciples were basically disillusioned. Now, we use disillusioned as a negative word, but it, it simply means that uh, the blinders have come off that the spell has been broken and we can see things for what they really are. And here's what I want you to know. Disillusionment is not necessarily a bad thing. It can actually be a painful gift to be stripped of the lies and the empty promises of our expectations or the things that we've depended on to get us through, even as the disciples on the road to Emmaus were. It's a painful but important gift from God. You see, disappointments can disillusion us, and that's a good thing. They can break the spell that the things of this world often hold over us. The spell that promises us that the things of the world will satisfy us. If we only get enough things or have enough of the right experiences or see enough exotic places or end up with the right person at the right time, the person who we think will make our, all of our dreams come true. What? To have our towers of hope and expectation torn down prepares us to meet the one who may not meet our every want but promises to always meet our every need. To have our expectations for God upended. Expectations that are often born from our own desires and not from God's revelation of his character is a true blessing in disguise. Why? Because it sets the stage for us to meet the real God on his terms. It sets the stage for us to meet the God who meets us in the midst of our disappointment with resurrection power, just as Jesus did when he met the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. One author says it like this. Maybe you picture God as a heavenly bellhop whose job is to satisfy your deepest desires, or Perhaps God is a holy matchmaker who will secure you a spouse 
Maybe God is a cosmic bodyguard who protects you from harm. Or the world's best nanny, making sure that your children turn out right. Or a divine doctor. Healing your every physical and mental ailment. Or a wonder-working accountant solving all your financial problems, provided that you drop off a portion in the church coffers, of course. And this works pretty well, as long as God seems to do what we want him to. But the moment he doesn't confirm, conform to our expectations, our whole world rattles. A baby is born with a disability. A person you love abandons you for another. A friend dies before her time. The expectations you placed on God ferment into distrust and then into disappointment. Disillusionment occurs. God shatters our fantasies, tears down our idols, and dismantles all of our cardboard cutouts. And this occurs when we discover that God does not conform to our expectations patience, but rather exists as a mystery beyond them. Now the two disciples on the road to Emmaus were initially prevented, notice what the text says, prevented from recognizing Jesus. But there he was in their midst, walking with them in resurrection life, Nevertheless, I wonder if your disappointments have, have led you to believe that the Lord has left you to fend for yourself. I wonder if recent letdowns have tempted you to think that God is against you and not for you. That he's abandoned you to the ash heap of your disappointments. Maybe the opposite is true. What if God has allowed you to endure your current disappointments, the, the setbacks and the letdowns in your life, in order to meet you in the midst of them and show you why and how a relationship with Him is so much richer and better and more satisfying than the fulfillment of your hopes, whatever those hopes might have been, whatever they are, and whatever they may be tomorrow. What if, like these two disciples on the road to Emmaus, who are sad and who are certainly without hope because of all that's happened to Jesus, what if like them, Jesus wants to meet you right where you are in the midst of your disappointment? What if you just right now don't have eyes to see? Him? Are you prepared to pray today? Lord, I know you promised never to leave or forsake me. And that includes right now in the midst of my disappointment but I can't see you. Help me to lay aside my expectations and to take your yoke upon me that I might learn from you what you would have me to learn from you during this difficult season. Not necessarily what I want to learn, but what you want me to learn. What if God wants to meet you smack dab in the middle of your disappointments right now, but more than that, what if God intends to use your disappointments to, to show you more of his goodness and his power? So Jesus walks along with these two beleaguered disciples for a while. He asks them about what they're talking about. He asks them to clarify these things that have happened in Jerusalem. They tell him that their hopes were in this Jesus who was a prophet but who was betrayed by the leaders of the nation. And then Jesus moves from asking questions to making statements. Verse 24. Some of those who went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And then Jesus says to them, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? 
And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So here Jesus steps into the disappointment of these two disciples as they walk to Emmaus. And he first of all exhibits a purposeful curiosity probing the subject of their conversation. Of course, they reveal their expectations to him and they try to process out loud all the rumors that they've heard about Jesus being alive. And then after listening for a spell, the risen Jesus speaks. And these two disciples get an Old Testament lesson from Jesus himself. But it's not just any Old Testament lesson. Luke tells us that Jesus took them from the beginning, Genesis, to the end, Malachi, and interpreted all the things in between concerning himself. In other words, he took the Old Testament, turned it inside out, and told them how the story of the Old Testament was all about him. These two disciples on the road to Emmaus, they got much more than what they bargained for that day. You see, at the bottom of their bitter disappointment, Jesus met them. But more than simply meeting them and more than simply walking incognito with them, Jesus opened up the scriptures to them and revealed a stunning landscape, a story that told of his glory from front to back. Folks, this was not just Jesus giving a Bible lesson, though. This was Jesus setting the stage to open the eyes of these two disciples to his presence among them in a powerful and personal way. This was fellowship. The Word of God in the hands of the risen Son of God. And this particular scene is falling upon their dry and thirsty hearts and awakening these two disciples to new life. life. Life that compels them, even as it happens, to want more of this man and to want more time with this man. In fact, as the story goes on, you'll see that these two disciples, they can't get enough of Jesus, enough time with Jesus, and enough of the things that Jesus is saying to them. Notice verse 28. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. Jesus acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread, he blessed and broke and gave it to them. And what happened? Their eyes were open and they recognized him. Notice. Notice how they insist that Jesus stay in their home when he acts like he's going further down the road. Notice how these two disciples urge him strongly. Oh, friends, that that would be the case with us. Oh, for a deeper desire to be with Jesus. To learn from Jesus. To fellowship with Jesus. To know Jesus and his sustaining power in a richer, more personal way as a result of this challenging, difficult, and strange season. Brothers and sisters, what if the Lord intends your disappointment and my disappointments to send us running toward him for hope, running toward him for joy, toward him for peace, toward him for nourishment, toward him for strength, for refuge, toward him for help, and ultimately, like these two disciples, toward Jesus for more of Jesus. That's exactly what these disciples wanted. So they invite him into the house. Jesus sits down at table with them and he does exactly what he had done when the disciples celebrated their last Passover with Jesus in the exact same order he had done it. He took the bread, he blessed the bread, he broke the bread, and he gave them the bread. 
And it was in that sharing of that meal with those two disciples that their eyes were open and they knew it was him. Friend, don't neglect friendship and fellowship with Jesus during this season. Your disappointments, your dashed expectations may be the very place the very crossroads at which you meet Jesus afresh and through which you find your fellowship with him deepening. That's exactly what happened to these two disciples. It's important that you and I not allow the letdowns we're experiencing to drive us away from Christ. Instead, we should allow them to lead us to him to the living water that satisfies, to the food that nourishes. It's important that you and I come to the Word expecting in our disappointments to meet Jesus there. Perhaps expecting the Holy Spirit to show us some things about our Savior during this season that we've never seen before. Brother and sister, I want to encourage you Allow Christ to feed your empty soul. And trust that the food he has is more filling than anything you were hoping for before this crazy season has descended upon us. And who knows? Who knows how God may reveal more of his goodness and his power to you during this season. You know, at the lowest point in his life, and in the darkest part of the darkest valley, Job met God personally and powerfully in a way that changed his life forever. You know, Job may never have gotten answers to his why questions. And you and I may never get answers to our why questions regarding this particular season either. But at the end of it all, Job did get more of God. Notice what Job says in Chapter 42, verses 5 and 6. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. You know what? Maybe during this crazy, strange season and these difficult days of disappointment, God wants to bring you to a place, perhaps similar to the place that he brought Job, where you and I are humbled such that we can receive now more of God and more appreciation for who God is for us and a deeper intimacy with God. Perhaps there are things God wants to teach us that will enable us to say, look, God, I've heard things about you, but man, as a result of this time in my life, I've seen you work. I've seen you. Final question this morning. What if God intends to encourage us in our letdowns so that we can encourage others walking through their own disappointments? Notice how this passage ends. Verse 32. The two disciples said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures. And they rose that same hour, notice they didn't delay, and they returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what, they, what had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Now, you have to notice what the two disciples did once they realized that it was Jesus who had been with them. Once they realized themselves that he was indeed alive. Luke says that they wasted no time. That they left where they were. They went right back to Jerusalem to confirm the news of Jesus' resurrection among the other disciples. They announced his resurrection and they told of all that they had experienced in Christ's presence. In fact, they said the Lord has risen indeed. Notice 
just like Job. Not because they had heard it from someone else, but what? They had seen it. They had been with it. They had experienced the power, the presence, and the goodness of the risen Christ themselves. Now, I guarantee you that you know someone during this season who is experiencing disappointment. I guarantee you that you know someone who may be wrestling with the death of a dream, the death of a long-awaited desire, someone who has had to shelve long-laid plans, someone who could use some rock-solid hope and a word of encouragement right now. Maybe it is that high school or college senior who won't get to walk across the stage. Maybe it's that person who recently lost the best job they've ever had. Maybe it's that business owner who doesn't know how they're going to climb out of the hole. Maybe it's that bride who's had to postpone her dream wedding. Maybe it's the family who couldn't hold a public memorial service for their beloved relative who recently passed. Here's the point, friends. Many of us are aching for hope in the midst of disappointment and uncertainty. And those around us are looking for the same things. There's no greater source of hope than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And there may be no better time of year to be going through what we're going through than this time of year. Easter is one week from today. And we have the opportunity as the people of God to shout hope. To shout hope from the rooftops during a season when many are feeling increasingly helpless and hopeless. i got a question for you. Who can you share hope with this week? By the way, that's going to be our theme kind of heading into Holy Week, right? Share hope. Share hope. And we challenge you to find creative ways to do that with those around you this week. Write a card. Mail it. Make a phone call. Send an email or a text. Post something on social media every day about the sure and certain hope we have in a living Jesus during uncertain times. Goodness knows social media needs hope. And if you're watching us this morning and you've lost hope during a season of uncertainty and disappointment, I want to invite you to think of these days as an invitation from God to find rest for your soul in Christ. I want you to think of this time, I want you to think of what's happening right now as those who belong to Jesus coming into your home, coming through your computer, through your smartphone, doing exactly what the two disciples who experienced the risen Jesus were doing. I'm here to tell you He's alive. He's alive. And He can give you a hope beyond the shattered dreams and expectations of the hopes you've hoped in for so long. He's the only well of hope that will never run dry. And He alone has the ability to satisfy the longings of your soul and to heal your sin-sick heart that, was, that has hoped for so long in lesser things. If you will but bow the knee to him this morning, if you would but hand your life to him, he will hand you a living hope in return. Let's pray.